Hello, and welcome back to the second annual Nat King Cole Generation Hope Educators Conference. Our next clinician is Dr. Tiffany Cox. Dr. Cox is the director of bands at Lake Worth Community High School in Lake Worth Beach, Florida. She is a South Florida native and received her bachelor's degree in jazz trombone from Florida State University. She attended Florida Atlantic University for her master's and doctoral coursework. Her research focuses on race, class, and gender in music education with an emphasis on the impact of gender on the experiences of female band directors. Without further delay, speaking on career trends for women in instrumental music, please welcome Dr. Tiffany Cox. Good afternoon, Dr. Cox. Hi there, Mr. Rhodes. It's so nice to see you all. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started. I have a presentation for y'all. Okay. Here we go. So I wanna apologize in advance. Um, I'm currently at school um, in our chorus room, hiding from all my children where we have our last day of band camp today for marching bands. So if there's any ridiculous noise in the background, that's probably what's going on. I tried to hide far away as I can, but you know, teenagers will be teenagers. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and start for you all with a little bit of a background of the history of women in instrumental music. Um, a lot of what we do today has been impacted by the way that women have been treated throughout history. So we're gonna start and focus specifically on American music. Um, it's gonna be a brief overview, but um, enjoy the pictures on screens. Probably something most of us have not ever seen before is full women's bands from the 1800s. Um, so before we get started, it's really important to note that as we talk about the history of women in music, we are pretty much limited to the history of white women in music and white women of stature um, because of the way that history has been written down over time. It's hard enough to find the history of women in privileged situations, but um, women of color and low-income women have been largely erased from the music scene. Now, that doesn't mean that they didn't contribute in a huge way to our history. It just means that their stories have been lost. And there's a big movement right now in music education to try to recover those stories and see how they have imp influenced the way that we teach nowadays and all like how they've impacted music in general. Um, so we're going to start um, with the early 1700s. So in the early 1700s, women were finally permitted to attend schools of sacred singing. So it was the first time that women were ever allowed to study music outside of the home. Um, and it was limited strictly to sacred singing. Um, by the 1850s, however, opera became popular throughout Europe. And then in America, we kind of caught on board with that. And women started to be able to perform vocally with um, secular music on stage, um, which was revolutionary because women were not paid performers at that point. You were allowed to sing in the home and in church and things like that. But once we got onto stage, it was a whole different ball game. Um, by the end of the 19th century, women were starting to gain acceptance as instrumental music performers, but strictly on keyboard instruments, such as harpsichord, celeste, and piano. Um, once British style brass bands started to gain popularity through the 1860s and into the 1900s, school band programs emerged to give students an opportunity to learn those instruments as well, but girls were still prohibited from participation. Now, that doesn't mean that girls didn't find a way to participate because we will persevere. Um, families would often use the instrument that their sons were given to teach their younger daughters or older daughters how to play an instrument. And families eventually started to create their own band. Think of it as like the Partridge family of instrumental music. Um, so uh, girls and women found a way to learn the instruments at home. And even though they were de denied acceptance into orchestras, they started to create their own ensembles. So in a response to the limited access to ensembles, women started to branch out on their own. In 1873, Helen May Butler formed her own ladies brass band. Um, where there's a picture of her on the top right of the screen. Um, in 1937, the Chicago Women's Concert Band was founded and the Orchestra Classique was established in New York. Um, in 1938, the University of Wisconsin organized its own women's band and the female conductor and manager of the Orchestra Classique even published a newsletter called Women in Music, which was published between 1935 and 1940. Um, by 1925, Schools across the country had adopted instrumental music curricula in the form of school band plans, which were designed by John Philip Sousa and Austin Harding, who is the band director of the University of Illinois. Um, they published 
these curricula uh, programs that were distributed by instrument manufacturing companies. So you got a whole package of instruments, the curricula, and an educator that went with it for 12 weeks. So these educators oftentimes were ex-military, male, and white. Um, so they came to your school for 12 weeks, got the band program started, and then after that moved on to another school, um, which honestly, if you think about it, is a great setup for like Con Selmer. Um, in the late 1930s, Mark Biddle organized the instrumental music pro program at Winthrop College in South Carolina after distributing a questionnaire to the student body where he found that out of 1600 students, over 300 of them wanted to learn how to play an instrument. So given the popularity of American band music at the time, the response was anticipated, but everyone was shocked that women could dare to want to play an instrument. Um, so the Winthrop College Instrumental Music Program developed into a concert band and a marching band, which you can see at the top left of the screen. Um, and despite the movement of inclusion of women in instrumental music ensembles, women were still excluded from marching bands and in most cases, instrumental music all together. So the Winthrop College was absolutely revolutionary in getting women into the instrumental music scene. This quote <laughs> comes from some of the research that I have done um, and I found in a review of literature. Um, it is simply not acceptable to see a woman contorting her body in unfeminine ways around a tuba or a cello, lest she create intense discomfort or arousal in the male members of the audience. Now, I don't know about any of you, but I feel like the least attractive thing that a woman can do is sit with a gigantic tuba, but maybe you're into that stuff. That's cool. Um, but it's kind of like gives you a little bit of a look into what we're facing and how women in instrumental music were perceived and still up until recently have been perceived. So these two women on the screen are Lorelai Conrad and Virginia Allen, also known as Ginny Allen. Um, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about them because they're incredibly influential in our history as women in instrumental music. Um, so we'll start with Lorelai. In 1991, Lorelai Conrad made history by becoming the first woman to receive a commission as US Navy officer bandmaster. She also became the first woman to conduct a Navy band overseas. The irony of this accomplishment is that Lorelai was conducting the Navy band at a time when women were still not allowed to play instruments in the ensemble. So similarly, Ginny Allen made history in the US Army Bands program by becoming the first woman to command and conduct an active duty military band. She served as principal conductor of the US Army Forces Command Band in Atlanta and secured her place in history by becoming the first woman conductor of the US Military Academy Band at West Point. Uh, Ginny Allen served as an administrator for the Army Bands program in Washington, D.C., and now is on music faculty at Juilliard, where she has held several teaching positions throughout the years. So absolutely pivotal and incredible people. Um, Ginny Allen, just to note also, has an incredible Facebook group called w Women Banding Together, um, which brings together female band directors and conductors from the entire world um, for collaborative efforts. They do happy hours and like virtual events and things like that. It's a really great initiative if you're interested. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about my own research. So I recently graduated with my PhD from Florida Atlantic University in December of 2020. Um, it's quite the endeavor to be writing a dissertation and conducting a high school band at the same time. So it took a little while, but we powered through. Um, my research focuses on the experiences of female high school band directors in the state of Florida. So I had the privilege of interviewing six female high school band directors from our state and learning about their experiences and how their experiences align with existing research and how um, there's discrepancies within the research. And it was a really fascinating process. But the reason why I chose to focus on female high school band directors is because um, it's the population that is least represented. So high school orchestra, when we talk about instrumental music, we obviously include orchestra in that. But in high school orchestra programs, women are doing okay. They're almost at 50% in 2001. So I'm assuming now as we get more progressive and we understand that women, yes, are incapable, are capable of being directors, that this number is going up. So high school orchestra directors are represented very well. High school chorus directors, extremely well represented in the female department, but high school band directors, we were lagging severely behind. And then I wondered, does this have to do with just um, high school band or is it all of the bands? So this graph shows you 
that elementary school band directors are 46% female, middle school band directors are 36% female, and then high school band directors are 27% female. So instead of focusing on female band directors in, entirely, I decided to focus specifically on high school band directors to really get the most bang for our buck and make a difference in the field where it was most needed. So here's another quote from my research, um, from my um, review of literature. The influence that directors have on their students' career choices is so profound that it serves as the primary recruiting tool for the profession. Now, people might wonder why are we why are we talking about what directors can do to support girls as they go to be band directors? But the the important thing is is that like our the way that we present ourselves, the way that we support our girls and boys and non-binary kids, it really does matter. So as we go into teaching this year it's really important to think about how we're representing gender in our classroom and the examples that we're bringing in and the leaders that we're bringing into our rooms, the clinicians we're bringing in um, and the way that we ourselves are presenting ourselves as leaders. Um, so in my research, we found that there were four main categories of experiences that are, that are impacting female high school band directors the most. And the four categories are hiring processes that are discriminatory, discriminatory towards women, gender norms that are standard in our entire society that permeate into music education, social roles that have been accepted by men and women for generations that also permeate into our profession, and then the existence of an old boys club, which serves to perpetuate the marginalization of women within music education. And for the purposes of this study, we focus entirely on instrumental music, meaning band. Um, it was very much so a high school band related study, but a lot of this in my research and through doing my review of literature, I found that there's a lot of commonalities between what high school band directors are experiencing and middle school band directors are experiencing and choir directors and orchestra directors, drama directors, pretty much anyone who's working in a male dominated space, the women are experiencing similar obstacles to their profession. So we'll start with hiring practices. Women are hired into high school band positions later on in their lives with more teaching experience and with a higher level of education than their male counterparts. So this quote hit home for me because my own experience was I got out of college at 22 years old, you know, just like every music ed major does. And I got hired at an elementary position before I was even able to apply for a high school job. Um, and in the job application experience and in, like interviews and things like that, so many times I was told that I was too short or too nice or too cute or just not right for the job because I wouldn't be strong enough to handle the high school kids um, when it was really my passion and it's really what I wanted to do. Um, so I, I spent five, four years at the elementary school and did my time, got my master's degree and started applying for um, high school positions. So it eventually worked out, but this quote is pretty much exactly what I have been through. And in doing my research, I found that a lot of women were in the same boat. They had to get a master's degree before they were accepted as a high school band director, or they had to do time as an assistant director before they could be a director, or they taught at an elementary school or middle school before they got to the high school level. And I am in no way saying that teaching elementary is like a stepping stone to teaching high school or teaching middle school is a stepping stone, because I... I got out of there as soon as I can. Honestly, um, teaching teaching elementary music is is an incredibly noble profession and deserves all of our respect. But the trend is for women to have to take jobs that they were not interested in the first place and then move up to their actual dream job down the road. Um, whereas men are more inclined to get hired straight out of college with the same level of criteria. Um, so from my interviews, I have a lot of quotes throughout my presentation so you can see exactly what these band directors said. Um, I did use pseudonyms for everybody so we can't identify them. Interviewing six female high school band directors from the state of Florida was actually quite complicated um, because finding six women who are willing to participate in an hour long interview when there's marching band and their own kids and all kinds of chaos going on was pretty challenging, but we made it work and we banded together and we got it done. Um, so Sophie said, in my first interview for a high school band position, the principal said, I wouldn't want my daughter teaching in a place like this because it was a rough school. That was my indication he wasn't going to hire me. The school had been open since 1922. My interview was in 1988, and the school just hired their first female band director in 2017. So this quote actually is in reference to my school, um, not my principal, but um, my school. So I was the first female band director that was hired at my school in 2017. 
and my school has been open since 1922. So when people start to say, oh, well, gender's not an issue in music education, we're good, everyone has equal opportunities, that right there shows you that we don't because women throughout the years have applied for jobs and just don't get them because they, they're perceived as not being capable of handling them. Now I do teach at a Title I school, it's in a rough neighborhood, but that's no reason to discriminate based on gender. So social roles. So moving into social roles, this one is, is especially palpable for some women. Um, I was almost pushed into teaching middle school. My professor tried really hard to influence me towards middle school. He really tried to push me. There were some highly influential people in our state who were in a roundabout way telling women that they should be middle school band director or an associate director at the high school because that's where women go. So what we're seeing is a lot of these social roles aren't inherently visible. But when you look back on memories, it's really easy to see the ways in which women were treated differently than men. So a lot of my interview participants were like, oh, you know, gender doesn't impact me at all. Like I have every opportunity that my male band director friends have. But we realized through going through this process and tearing down the memories and like the walls that we put up that we really did have different experiences. And it, it ended up being kind of like a therapy experience for us to kind of vent to each other because female band directors don't really ever have an opportunity to get together. And we learned a lot from each other. So what we learned is that social institutions like schools have a great deal of impact on the establishment and perpetuation of gender stereotypes within society. When the concept is applied to instrumental music education, ide ideologies of patri patriarchal band traditions can be seen in the curriculum that band students are taught, the way ensembles are structured, and the literature that's performed. Um, women are often excluded from jazz band opportunities because of the instruments that they choose to play. An instrument selection has been proven to be highly gendered, like the girls play flute and boys play drums. Um, now, we like to think that that stuff is getting better, but studies done as recently as 2019 show that gender trends in instrument selection are not getting better. Um, we try to be as supportive as we can as directors, but there's so many outside factors that influence the, the students' instrument selection that it, it's hard to permeate all of those levels. So to better demonstrate the impact of social institutions on the profession of band directing, consider this scenario. A young girl who was educated in the American school band system that, established to, that was established to model the traditions of European military bands, which have a history of excluding women, then finds employment as a band director and continues to perpetuate the same school band system that she progressed through. She teaches her students the same way she was taught and uses the same content that was composed and hand-selected by generations of male band directors. The girls in these programs may never see themselves represented in the curricula and will likely be told or told biased information that perpetuates the marginalization of women in music. So it's thinking about as we as directors, as you look back on the, on the selections that you've played in your band programs and as a student in a band program, how many of those compositions were written by women? Um, and you can extrapolate it. How many of those compositions were written by people of color? How many of those compositions were written uh, by LGBTQ plus people? Um, a lot of it is by straight white men and we need to be branching out. So we need to start looking at the way that we teach and the why that we teach and kind of tear it apart and rebuild it from the ground up with equity in mind. Um, so Zoe said, we teach our students the same way that we were taught, we use the same content that was composed and hand selected by generations of male band directors and nothing changes. And then Amy in a similar interview said, I catch myself falling into the trap. I nominate the same white male adjudicators and clinicians even though I know that they are qualified women who could do the job. So it, it's hard to reflect on our own shortcomings, but it's really important as we're sitting in those FBA meetings or FBA meetings or FOA meetings or whatever your organization is um, to start to think about the people that we're nominating and the people that we're putting in front of our students. Because if we're nominating clinicians who look like all the other clinicians we've ever had, then are our students really getting a whole well-rounded experience when they go to those honor ensembles? Um, and the same thing goes with adjudicators. We need different perspectives. So gender norms. Participants in my study were asked to recall if they had ever felt intimidated by a colleague at a professional function, such as an annual state conference. Um, five out of the six participants were able to recall instances in which they felt intimidated by another band director or a clinician. Sarah, a self-identified extrovert, said that she might have experienced feelings of intimidation or fear when she was first starting, but doesn't know that she's feeling them right now. Rebecca had a similar sentiment saying, I can imagine myself not going up and talking to people 
Um, even going up to my, my interning teacher was almost terrifying. So these experiences of being at a conference and knowing for a fact that you should be using it for networking and you just can't is a very gender norm type situation. So social role theory, which was the foundation of my study, talks a lot about how we as um, individuals in society play different roles. So females in society play the role of a nurturer, whereas a male would um, play the role of, of a provider, things like that. And it's not that strict gender norm, but at the same time, a lot of these kind of permeate into what we're doing in our profession. So the idea that as girls are growing up, they're taught to just kind of like grin and smile and make it be pleasant for people and like don't don't cause any waves, don't disrupt the, the status quo, whereas boys are encouraged to be like reckless and courageous and brave and like say what they think and have opinions that kind of stuff permeates into our profession when girls are afraid girls women band directors are afraid to go up and say hey clinician nice job conducting i have a question about da 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 da, da. can i email you later and ask you about it whereas the male band directors in the same situation same level of qualifications are more than happy to go up shake hands and go grab a beer um so maria said if i'm out of session and i have a question i just avoid it and i don't ask my question I should have the courage and make it happen, but I just don't. Um, so the self-doubt concept and like lack of self-confidence and things like that are very, very common in female directors. And we also see this kind of trend going through our students as well. Um, I know for me, as a fact, I teach a, a very large population of Latina um, students and in their culture, women are not empowered to voice their opinions and to make change in the organizations that they're participating in. Um, and especially in the home, a lot of my girls are responsible for child care of their younger siblings or grocery shopping or doing the laundry for their entire family, things like that. Like not just their own responsibilities, but the whole family. So child care in teenagers definitely impacts them. Whereas like a, a sibling that's the same age, but male won't have any of those responsibilities. They're encouraged to go to school, get good grades, go to parties, participate in sports. So we have a whole battle with getting the girls just as involved as the boys. So professionally though, um, one of the trends that has been existing in all of the research and also my study was the existence of an old boys club in music education. So the problem is, is that band specifically is a male dominated career field and that stems from a military tradition and like the bands of john philip Sousa that excluded women and listen i'm not hating on Sousa, just saying it's it's a generational thing we're growing out of it um but these traditions still exist so in my study the participants noted the the present of the presence of this old boys club and lots of times they use the words good old boys or old boys club without me even provoking them to do it so it's something that they had talked about before or read about before it's a common occurrence unfortunately so amy said there's an old boys club in our district it's made of old white men who think they run the world they gather together in impenetrable circles and muscle their opinions over other in, others in debates so when you're sitting in there trying to decide the logistics of the next marching band assessment, um, the people who have been there the longest and also have the privilege of being male and white are the most likely to voice their opinions the most confidently. And then other people, younger band directors, female band directors, um, anybody who's in a marginalized population is going to feel like they don't have as big of a voice. Zoe said, at the summer convention, they used to have this golf outing. To me, it just reeked of good old boys. They never said that women weren't allowed, but it's just another part of the story. I feel like there's a lot that can be done to change this. People need to be made more aware that we get treated differently and there is a difference. So Zoe is a band director who's been teaching for 32 years, um, started as an assistant band director, moved on to have her own program, and she's been at the same school for that entire time. So the fact that she's been in the profession for that long and still has that feeling of we get treated differently is really unfortunate because we should be finding ways to overcome this. Um, so the, the important thing to note here is that like nobody's going out of their way to create a club that girls aren't allowed into. No one's doing that. It's just kind of a circle that just keeps perpetuating itself. And there needs to be active motion to abolish the systems that are existing right now that perpetuate the marginalization of women. Um, so as we go on, like here's some more quotes from the study. Maria said, everyone tries to push this illusion of fairness, but in reality, nothing can truly be fair. 
The old men have been there the longest and they have the biggest voice. You find yourself sitting there quietly while the big dogs duke it out in meetings and you have to deal with whatever they decide is best for everyone, even when it's not. Um, and then Sarah had a similar sentiment and saying, I think that it's, I, I think that it's people don't think they're discriminating. It's just indoctrinated into people. It's not, oh, you're a girl, you can't do this. It's something in the back of people's heads that they don't even know that they're thinking about. So this is the problem with social roles is that they're not things that we're constantly thinking about. Like no one's saying girls do this, boys do this, girls do this, boys do this. That's not happening in our society consciously, but it's unconscious information that we've gathered from the media, from our families, from social interactions. And we react in certain ways when you see different people doing things. Like I know for me, my first year as a band director, I got up in front of my band at our concert band assessment and I conducted, I got off the stage and the first comment that I got was how my pants made my butt look too good. And I was like, well, I want to know about my band. Like, don't, it was a friend. It wasn't like a, a stranger. It wasn't creepy or anything. But it was like, why is that the first thing you're saying to a brand new band director coming off the stage? It should be like, hey, I noticed that you're doing this. Here's some constructive feedback. Here's some compliments. Your band did great. Let me help you out. But instead, I got comments on my physical appearance, which would never happen to a male band director. So it's very much so a gendered experience that we're having. And there's a lot, of, a lot that can be done to change it. And to change it, we have to start in our classrooms. So my suggestions through the research, so this is not just me picking stuff out of my hat, but this is like actual empirically data supported evidence. Um, my suggestions on how to promote gender equity in your, your own classroom. Number one is bring gender to the forefront. So nowadays, a lot of directors might feel really uncomfortable talking about gender because they're not informed. So start to read up on what it means to be gender fluid, what it means to be non-binary, binary, what it means to be transgender, what it means to be cisgender, start to understand the terminology and get really comfortable with it in your classroom. And then support your students. So I'm not saying like call out every kid who's gender nonconforming. I'm saying make gender an issue that we're all okay talking about. The more comfortable that you get in your classroom talking about gender, the more your students are going to feel supported because they're reading about it. It's on their Instagram feeds, it's on their Snapchats, it's on their TikToks all over the place. So bring the things that are really hot right now, the pop culture references and things like that, and bring them into your classroom. There's nothing wrong with talking about gender. As a matter of fact, it'll make you all more comfortable that this big elephant in the room is now out in the open. Um, it's important to educate all stakeholders on the implications of gender stereotyping of instruments. So for me, I found that it's exceptionally important to educate the parents. So parents lots of times will say, oh, well, you're a girl, you need to play a small instrument. And for me, I have a hard time with that. I play trombone. Um, so I very much so take a big stance on educating the parents and saying, hey, instruments don't have gender. Look at this particular female black tuba player who's absolutely killing it in the Chicago Philharmonic. Um, I, I try to provide examples and talk to parents and, and let the kids really choose what they're passionate about. Um, so at the high school level, I don't have a whole lot of beginning band. I do accept beginners in my program, but at the middle school level, this is going to be really important. So maybe when you're doing your like instrument petting zoo or your fitting day, have the parents there show a slideshow of, of people playing non-traditional instruments for their gender. Mix it up, um, show a girl playing drum set, show a boy playing flute. Let the parents get comfortable with those images and start to tear down those gender issues with instrument selection because they do impact your kids' opportunities down the road. Um, so I'm not saying like put like avoid putting kids on flute or clarinet because then they can't do jazz band. Um, I'm just saying like kind of mix it up and make it so that it's your entire clarinet section is not all girls, your entire flute section is not all girls. Um, one of the biggest suggestions that I have is implementing blind auditions for all ensembles. So really this, this started as a like, hey, let's do blind auditions for jazz bands because what I noticed in my study was that girls were intimidated from participating in jazz bands the most. And that's really unfortunate because for me, my, my bachelor's degree is in jazz and I wouldn't be the person that I am today without my jazz experience. But what happens is when girls choose to play, for example, I'm going to use flute, when they choose to play flute in sixth grade, now the likelihood of them participating in a high school jazz band when they get there is slim to none because a lot of band directors are going to be like, no, you're a flute player, you can't switch instruments. So one of the things that I do in my program 
is I encourage my woodwind players to be doublers. I want them to learn how to play saxophone. I want my clarinets to play saxophone. I want my flutes to play saxophone. That's going to make them more marketable in the future when they want to audition for schools, when they want to um, be gigging musicians. It also just gives them more opportunity to perform with your ensemble. So like maybe your concert band's playing somewhere, but then your jazz band's going to go somewhere else. And all of this can um, be kind of taken and adapted for the orchestral setting as well. So you have like your all girl violin section, maybe one of them wants to learn to play cello. Like the instrument divide for gender is not as big in orchestra, but, but there is still gender, gender stereotypes for instruments in the orchestra as well. Um, so kind of keep that in mind. Um, percussion is one of the things that's real easy to get kids to double on. A lot of my flute players during marching band season will be in the front ensemble and they learn how to play mallet instruments for marching band season and then they switch back to concert band flute. Um, so there's a lot of ways to give your kids um, exposure to that kind of stuff. But blind auditions for all ensembles are really important. Um, you have the kid come in, don't say anything, just play their instrument for you while you face the other way or you put them behind a, like, a divider or something. But that way you're doing absolutely as fair as you possibly can um, and have a panel of people participate in your auditions as well. Um, this is also a suggestion that I have for um, programs that are doing all district, all county, things like that. Um, I know in Florida, in our all-state um, audition program, it is a blind audition, and kids get accepted based on their actual performance. Um, so I would like to see that be implemented into our all-county program as well, so that kids um, have the most opportunity as possible. And then seek out professional development on gender equity. So a lot of the times when you go to a big conference, there's so many sessions that are going on all the time and they're, they coincide with each other and it's really hard to get around and see everything. So if you can't make it to the sessions that you really wanna see, make sure you go back and watch the replay, make sure that you get the session notes or any handouts or pamphlets, all that kind of stuff is very important. Um, I know I have presented at several conferences like FMEA and NAFME and the International Women's um, Band Directors <laughs> Association, sorry. Um, I've, I've been to all these conferences and I've noticed that a lot of the times my rooms are full of women, but I'm not presenting just to women. We already know what's going on. I would love to see more male band directors get involved in gender equity because it would show our girls that they really are worth the extra attention. The support that they need exists, but we need to get the word out. Um, so if you're going to a session, Try, try to seek out something that you're not super comfortable with, because a lot of the times we like to say, oh, well, I'm a jazzer, so I'm going to go to the jazz sessions and I'm going to learn all about jazz, but I already know that stuff. So I'm going to look for something that I'm not as comfortable with, and I'm going to try to absorb as much information as possible. So if gender is one of those things for you, really try to go out of your way to go to gender equity based sessions and include that information into your teaching. Um, second to last, bringing guest clinicians who look like your students. So this is important for boys, girls, um, low-income students, black and brown kids, LGBT kids. Um, bring in people who look like your kids. So for me, I'm a white female band director in a predominantly Hispanic and Haitian Creole school. Um, so I don't bring in white female band directors to work with my kids. I bring in Latino band directors. Right now I have the band director from Boynton Beach High School working with my kids while I'm doing this. Um, so he's doing a clinic with them and he's a black male band director from a totally different background as me. So I went to Florida State, he went to the Bethune Cookman. So we're getting all the different perspectives and I want my kids to see themselves in the clinicians that we're bringing in and see that like, see their leadership style, see their conducting style, see their musicianship style and how they communicate and bring that into my band to make them even stronger and more empowered. Um, so look at the people who you have on your staff, look at the people who are teaching your kids um, lessons when you bring them into your rooms, but look at the people who are coming in to listen and adjudicate and give feedback also, because all of those things matter. Um, no child should go through a school band program and feel like they haven't been represented in the program. Um, it goes for orchestra, choir, anything else as well. Um, my very last one is please, please, please don't ignore your well-behaved, quiet kids. Um, my favorite example of this is my last year drum major, Maria, came into my program four years ago. Absolutely the shyest kid I think I've ever met in my life. Um, but she was Guatemalan and she had five younger siblings, all under the age of 11. And as she moved through the program, she grew up, but she, she was responsible for childcare for the family because her dad worked full time. So there was a lot of Maria having to miss rehearsal to go and take care of the family or making family plans or leaving early, things like that. But she was in charge of grocery shopping for the family, doing all the laundry at the laundry mat. Um, 
taking care of all the babies. When we went to virtual school, in a lot of times she was logging into my, my Google Meets um, with the baby on her lap feeding a baby. And it's not her kid and it shouldn't be her responsibility, but in her family, it had to be. So Maria in the classroom was the most well-behaved, put together, quiet kid, but we realized that Maria was really struggling. So we were able to get her some mental health help. We were able to advocate for her and help her self-confidence grow. And she ended up getting accepted to the UCF Honor Band, University of Miami Honor Band. She got accepted to Allstate this year. She like ended up absolutely skyrocketing. She became the drum major of my program. And even though she still had those lingering feelings of self-doubt and like low self-confidence and body image issues and things that are associated with all of that, she absolutely blossomed into a powerhouse leader in the program and ended up getting a full ride scholarship to the University of Florida to study environmental conservation. So she's not doing anything with music. She's gonna be in the marching band and playing a concert band and stuff, but empowering that one kid didn't just empower Maria, it influenced her whole family and it influenced all the other kids in my program. So now I have other kids who were really, really shy and are starting to come through the ranks and they're citing Maria as their role model, which is really cool to see because like, I'm not trying to influence every single kid individually like that, but you see the trickle down effect of like empowering just one of them to audition for an honor band that they didn't think they could get into. Um, and that honor band experience becomes really powerful. So there's three big things that we can do to support our girls, like the big gigantic takeaway. Number one is find role models for them that are positive and supportive. So if it's you, that's great and awesome, but it's also really important to find them leaders and mentors that are same gender. So for me, I make a point of hiring a diverse staff. Like I am the only white person on my staff and I bring in Latina women to work with my girls and my, my woodwinds and stuff like that. I make sure that I have LGBT members on my staff ready to talk to kids and help them out. Um, we try to really diversify that so that the kids get experience with all kinds of leadership styles because my leadership style might not suit everybody and that's good. Like we wanna bring individuality into this. Um, honor ensembles are super important. I talked a little bit about that and how they impact self-confidence, um, but providing leadership opportunities is really important. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that. So in my study, um, all of the participants talked about the importance of a supportive role model. So Maria said, um, my high school band director was the reason why I decided to start taking music seriously at all. He believed in me and kept me motivated and on track. So a male band director, which for the record, all six of the female participants in my study had never, ever, ever experienced a female band director in middle school, high school, collegiate, or even after that in community band. So we are grown women who are conducting high school band programs and successful high school band programs, but have never actually been led by a female band director. So, and I'm included in that. So that makes seven of us. <laughs> um, Sarah said, my band director was just like a father figure for us. He was a very positive person. He was one of those people who his door was always open. So having that relationship with your kids and so they know that they can come in and talk to you when things are going rough is really important. Um, Zoe said, I've been lucky to have some great band directors throughout school and college, but I'll tell you, all of them are white and all of them are male. Um, so again, Zoe's been in the profession for a while, so I'm not surprised by this, but unfortunately, our younger band directors are experiencing the same thing. If you look at the collegiate band programs around the area, and specifically in Florida, most of the band directors are male. We're starting to see changes go on, which is really cool and specifically exciting when it's like an athletics band director, but we're seeing a lot of male directors in orchestra and in band, and jazz is the absolute worst. Um, the choral world has always been a little bit more balanced just because of the soprano alto situation, but in, in orchestra and band, there's not a whole lot of diversity going on. So it's hard to find role models. Now, it is entirely possible to be a male band director and be very supportive of your girls, as we're seeing here. All of our participants had very supportive male band directors that provided them with lots of opportunities to succeed inside and outside of the classroom. So it was really cool. Um, honor bands. So Rebecca said, I knew I wanted to be a band director, but I wasn't sure what college I wanted to go to. Then I made it to the Tri-State Honor Band at Florida State. Um, that experience solidified it in my mind. I knew where I was gonna go and I knew it was the right place for me. So if Rebecca had not been given that opportunity to go to Tri-State, then she never would have been able to have the experience of being on the college campus, like immersively for a couple of days, never would have met the staff, never would have met the private lessons teachers and never would have been able to make that decision. 
Um, Sophie said, I loved all the all state and band and orchestra experiences. I was able to do both and I learned a lot from the different conductors. It was a great way to see different styles of teaching. They were fantastic. So that's what we're providing our kids with. When you get into an honor band, you're providing them with access to other traditions, other ways of teaching, other ways of wording things that might click with them a little bit better than how we say it. And that's okay. Um, they also get to perform different literature. They have to learn collaboration and cooperation skills through working with different types of kids from different schools they've never met before. I know at every honor band that my kids have been to, they've had a little bit of culture shock because you come from a very black and brown dominated school to a very white honor band. So the kids have a little bit of acclimating to do. Um, but I, it's, it's all part of the experience is learning how to work with different people. And then those skills take them far beyond band and into their career paths and into college down the road. Lastly, leadership. Leadership is perhaps the most important thing. Um, Maria said, my favorite memory from high school is being drum major my senior year. I just love being in charge. I love being in a leadership position, having extra responsibilities and having to set the example. Um, Zoe said, being drum major my senior year, that helped me to solidify my decision. I had already decided to be a music major, but being drum major made me more excited to conduct bands. And then Sarah commented that I really fell in love with conducting. I just love conducting. Um, so I, I knew it was something that I wanted to keep doing. So a lot of the participants in my study also had been given opportunities to conduct outside of the marching band arena. So they were drum majors during their marching band seasons, but then also were given the opportunity to conduct a concert band and prepare a band for MPA or to just supplement and help out a band director with sectionals and things like that. So conducting experience was huge for them. And I know that in the band world, it's easy for us to give that to one student and be like, you're the drum major, you're the conductor. But you also have students who run sectionals. You also have students who do pull out lessons and things like that. So maybe giving them a little bit of a conducting lesson so that they're able to better run the, the smaller practices that we have might be a good idea. Um, we also might give kids of just like, you know, that week after the winter concert when is before, before winter break, maybe just like do a conducting lesson with the whole band and give them a little bit of a taste and see how it goes. You'll be so surprised to see how the kids respond to it. So to wrap it up, I have some um, suggestion reading for you guys. I don't know if we're going to post the slideshow or anything, but if you do, you can click on each one of these books um, and it'll, it'll take you directly to the link for it. Um, a lot of these books are on race, class, and gender because they do intersect. So um, you, the experiences of your students are going to be dependent on how they fall on that spectrum. Um, there's also some stuff on intersectional feminism, which is a really good read if you're interested in, in expanding your understanding of feminism, because it's not a dirty F word, um, and it does not in any way imply that we need to be focusing on girls more than boys. It's an equality movement. Um, so take a look at some of these books, take a picture of the screen, screenshot it, do what you need to do, but definitely some solid reads that everybody should be reading. Um, also almost entirely written by uh, Black female authors. So that's all I have for you. I do want to leave you with a quote from Julie, Julie Greenwald, who is the COO of Atlantic Records. Um, and this was from the music, Women in Music um, Awards. So now more than ever, it's incumbent on every one of us to raise up the next generation of female leaders so that the future of women in music events, or just women in music education, <laughs> <laughs> um, the the ex executive woman of the year or executive of the year will stand up here and thank a woman for being her mentor. Now it's time to change the industry for the better. It's all right here in how we support each other and how we're committed to providing young women with a safer environment free from harassment and discrimination. So specifically for the women in music events and executive of the year and things like that. That's great and awesome, but this is something that we can transfer directly to music education. So it's time to stand up for our girls. It's time to support them. It's time to encourage them as they become leaders and find their feet and flex their leadership muscles. And if they don't become band directors, that's totally okay. But what we want to do is provide equal opportunities to all of our kids, regardless of race, class, or gender. So thank you very much. Wow, you know, thank you so much, Dr. Cox. You know, I, I, um, before we just jump in on any questions, uh, just please feel free to send me some questions. Uh, we have about 15 minutes, and uh, this is such a really great topic that you you brought to light. And just just from my experience, um, you know, when we talk about the social roles, uh, I remember coming out of um, my undergrad as a you know music educator, looking to be a band director. Uh, you know, I, I had you know one of the good old boys, as you would say say, uh, you know, you will be great in an inner city school. They, they need strong, 
strong men of color like you. And I'm like, what does that mean? Like, why should I just go to one place? Or why, why can't I have access to any and every community? And, you know, back then you would just hear those sort of, uh, you know, comments and just shrug it off. And I, and I think uh, one thing I, I saw a quote one day that has uh, really just resonated with me where it says, make the change and be the change. Um, and, 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 and as you're saying, we have to go into our own classrooms and, and, and be the change, where, as you're saying, bringing in clinicians that, that represent your community, represent your students, um, that, that's, that's very essential. I know we, we always want the top, you know, collegiate, you know, people out there to, you know, so we can brag about or post on social media, guess who came into my band room, but, you know, it's, it's, it's a bigger picture than that. And so I, I'm glad you brought that to the, to the forefront. Um, and also what was um, really startling data that you brought up was the percentage of women band directors at the elementary level being 46%, middle school 36, 36%, and high school 27%. I, I found that very, very um, eye-opening because uh, that's, it, it, it does look like that. And I, I appreciate some, that data you brought to the table today. Yeah, actually, in the state of Florida, only 18% are of, of uh, high school band directors are women. So Florida's not doing so hot. <laughs> <laughs> you no, know, what what would you say to, um, and you've kind of said it, but I mean, just in your real time, now you're, you're immersed in band camp right now, and you're talking to your students all day. You know, what would you say to that um, female student or gender student um, that, about education and music education and the paths to take and opportunities that are there. Because again, I, I think about my career path. I think, I don't think I've ever had a female band director come from, from my tutelage in my, in my band room. So it's, it's, it's taken to me, but what are you saying? What, what are some of the things that you, you think you can do uh, as you move forward? Yeah. So for my kids, um, we have a very open relationship and I, I have open dialogue with them about everything. Like when the uh, Black Lives Matter movement started coming through, we had open dialogue with that. And that's kind of the privilege that I have of have coming from a empirical research background is I, I have a lot of the like actual data driven responses that keep me apolitical in the school setting, um, which is really nice. So I'm, I'm not talking opinions here. I'm looking at like real actual scientific data. So my kids knew exactly what I was doing with my dissertation. They knew the research, they knew the people I was interviewing, they were involved in the experience, they were able to ask me questions. It was really phenomenal. So the kids have gotten really engaged in the process and I'm very clear with them. I'm like, hey, I'm bringing in this type of clinician because I want you to see. Like today, Mr. Barfield, who's here working with my kids, he comes from Bethune Cookman and I went to Florida State. So we went to very different colleges of music but I want his, I want his perspective. I want to learn from him. Like, I can't wait to be done with this and go over there and see him teaching because I'm so excited to learn from him. Because I think what it's important is, is modeling for our kids too, is saying like, okay, I don't know everything, but I'm, I'm ready to learn. So when they come in with new information on like a different, like when we started talking about like gender non-conforming things, like I had to learn about that kind of stuff too, because I heard them start to use the, inform the, the words in my classroom. So it's, it's kind of staying on the cutting edge, but it's also kind of letting the kids drive the conversation. They're going to, they're going to want to, but say like, hey, like I went to this, I went to this um, session over the summer and I realized that I'm not bringing in enough women clinicians. So guys, this year, I'm going to make a point to do that. And if I'm not doing it, hold me accountable. Like say something to me. Um, I mean, like all of our clinicians look the same. Have them start to see it because what they'll start to do is they'll be able to start seeing that in their lives as well. And that's, it's a really important skill to have. Great. I have a question for you. And, and, I, and I know, you know, when you're at your elementary school, it was on the outer skirts of Boca Raton. Um, and that was a different community. But what 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 is it that you had to learn when you moved to Lake Worth as far as a community? Because it's such a diverse, uh, multicultural, you know, I think sometimes people think that's not from South Florida or, you know, the Cuban community. And uh, it's no, it's not not much necessarily in, in Lake Worth. It's a very diverse multicultural. What was probably some things that you had to learn very quickly coming into that community? Um, one of the things that I learned very quickly was that you have to be authentically yourself with the kids. Um, if you try to pretend to be something that you're not, it's not going to work. So for me, I have a very sarcastic sense of humor and I bring that into my teaching. It's, it's right there on the forefront and my kids really get it. 
Um, but I think also one of the things that people forget a lot about, like per particularly my population, I have a very low income pop, um, community, um, is that there's a different way to talk to different types of kids from different cultures. So like one of the things that I learned first coming in, which I, I knew already from my own upbringing, was that kids who grow up low income and specifically in Haitian families and Latino families, if you speak to them quietly, they think you don't care about them. But if you project your voice and you're involved and you're emphatic and you're like, you're just vocal about the way that you're doing things, they think you really care because in their families, noise means love. Um, and like the houses are always full of noise and when it's quiet, no one's there and it's scary for them. So that was one of the things that I had to learn was um, how to use my voice in a way that um, aligned with their cultural expectations of how someone who cares about them is going to talk to them. But I also learned that I needed to be pay close attention to the girls who are the well-behaved girls and the quiet ones, because they're the ones who are the most mature, but they've also been silenced in their families the most. So finding a way to reach those specific kids was really important for me. So my, my drum major Maria was one of them. I have my whole clarinet section, honestly, <laughs> like that's, that's where they are, um, is learning how to access those girls and like joke with them, like pride, like on the side, instead of like teasing them with the whole band and like the witty banter thing doesn't work with those kids. So pulling them aside, being like, hey, are you okay? Hey, I got this like donation from the Nat King Cole Foundation and they donated us some socks and stuff. Like, do you guys need them at home? Let me like drop them off at your house over the summer or something like that. Those little gestures get you really deep into the community and it gets the kids really invested. Great, that's that's fantastic. And, and you know, I think, you know what, I, I asked that question because, you know, no matter where you are in your career, you have to look at, you have to point the finger at yourself and make the joke on yourself sometimes. And I, I quickly always share the story that um, I taught in Homestead, which was very similar to, to Lake Worth community. And it was very diverse with different multicultural um, children. And, uh, and then my next move was to a very affluent area in Palm Beach County. And I remember my first day of band camp and I'm like, we're going to do this marching show. And everyone was like, yeah, we're going to do this doing jazz band. Yeah. And then I was like, and we're going to have the best Christmas concert. And everyone was like, and I'm like, well, the kid raised their hand. They were like, we don't celebrate Christmas. And I was like, yes, well, that's right. We, we're going to have a, and they were like, we're going to have a great Hanukkah. And then the kids went crazy. But the point is, I, I, my point I want to make is, as educators, we have to know our community. That's that's first and foremost. If we don't if we don't understand our community, then there's a disconnect instantly. And we'll go back to what you're saying. Then as children trust you, and then they want to do everything for you and do anything for you because you know they trust and you understand their community. Uh, that's that's I think that's very critical. Um, Dr. Cox, uh, anything else you would like to just parting words of encouragement that you would do before you jump into your band camp and, and give your, your your students some love for the rest of the day? Anything you can just share with us in your in your in your exit? Um, honestly, I would say just make make a point of looking at the students who are underrepresented in your program. And for every program that looks different, it's not just girls, it's not just people of color. Like honestly, at my school, my white kids are the underrepresented kids. Um, and so make, make a point to know that they're well taken care of um, and really just advocate for their, them and their needs. Reach out to them, get, their, get to know their families. Honestly, one of the best events that I throw every year is our end of the year potluck and all the families bringing food from their cultures and it just gets the families there, gets you to talk to them. If there's a language barrier, that's fine. Make the kids translate, they do it all the time. Um, but also don't get discouraged. This is, it's definitely a journey. It's a step-by-step -step thing. It's not something that's gonna change overnight. Um, I know for me personally, I'm still experiencing gendered expectations. Um, I always said if I wrote a book, it would be called Band Directors Don't Wear High Heels because my principal at my school decided to say that to me on the day of my first concert. Um, and I was like, what? It's not about my outfit. Stop. Um, and, you know, I'm still experiencing it all the time when we go to marching band competitions and people go up to my male staff and say, hey, I need your band to go da 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 da. And my staff is like, oh, no, that's her job. Like, go over there. Um, so it's something that we can bring to the forefront and we can change together, but it's important for us all to be on board to make it happen. Absolutely. I think that's was said very eloquently. I always say in, in, in addition to that, it's, it's the mile, not the sprint when we are, when we choose this profession. Um, well, Thank you, Dr. Cox, for sharing such an exceptional um, insight into gender perspectives uh, in our field of music education. And on behalf of Nat King Cole, Generation Hope, we want to thank you for being with us today.
Thank you so much. And thank you everybody awesome. for being here. <laughs> thank you. Um, we will now take a very short break to stretch and anything else you need to do to refresh yourself before we get into our final session of the day. We will start promptly at 3 p.m. Thanks again.